everyone. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for this really stimulating conference. I've really learned a lot from the talks and for, from the discussion with the participants. Um, so uh, some of you might notice that I actually changed the title for my talk last night. Uh, I've been thinking about how to, what's the best title that would fit the thing of this uh, string theory conference. And I struggle a little bit uh, about it. Uh, but then after Tadashi's talk, I realized that this might be the best <laughs> title. <laughs> okay. All right, but jokes aside, um, there will be some of the steps, that, some of the key steps in, in the talk that will be familiar uh, uh, for, for people who have studied string theory. Having said that, even if you don't know anything about string theory, uh, I hope the talk will be self-contained. All right, so let me start with some quick introduction, which Jonathan already uh, covered part of it beautifully uh, uh, in this conference. So conventional global symmetries are described by groups, and that's uh, manifest from, the, from Wigner's theorem. Wigner said that in quantum mechanics, every symmetry has to be implemented by a unitary or an anti-unitary operator. And one special property of the unitary or anti-unitary operator is that it has an inverse. U dagger is U inverse. And they furthermore form a group. In recent years, there's a, a new kind of global symmetry has drawn a lot of attention in quantum field theory, in condensed matter physics, and also in quantum information theory. These symmetries are called non-invertible symmetries, and are implemented by conserved operators that do not have inverses. Even though they sound weird, they actually lead to new conservation laws, new selection rules, new constraints on RG, and many more. Now you might think this sounds totally bizarre. You might have to work very hard to come up with the first example of a non-invertible symmetry. But in fact, if you look at arguably the simplest quantum field theory of all, namely the 1 plus 1D critical icing conformal field theory, there's already a non-invertible symmetry. There it's associated with the Kramer's one-year duality. Now, if, you, th if this is the first time you see the formula, don't panic. In the rest of the talk, I'm not going to use it directly, but I just want to show some of the examples that I personally like a lot. So in the Ising model, there's a defined Z2 conserved operator, which I denote by eta, it squares to one. But the interesting thing is that in addition to this Z2 ordinary conserved operator, there's another one, which I call D. And as you can see from this formula, D doesn't obey a group-like multiplication law. A second example that I personally like a lot, uh, which, was, um, which was discovered uh, in a paper I wrote with my student, Icho Choi, and my collaborator, Hota. There's also a closely related paper by Clay and Kantaro in 2022. It's the chiral symmetry in 3 plus 1D QED. So this is just U1 Maxwell gauge theory coupled to a massless Dirac fermion. Uh, in these two papers, it was recognized the chiral symmetry is actually not completely broken by the Adler, Bell, and Jakiv anomaly. Rather, the rational parts are resurrected uh, as a non-invertible symmetry. And intuitively, there, the ABJ anomaly was cured by a fractional quantum whole state. Again, if this is the first time you see the formula, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, let me just say that there has been a lot of uh, developments of non-invertible symmetry in higher space-time dimensions uh, since a couple of years ago. And there are also applications to string theory and quantum gravity, and Jonathan gave a beautiful review of many of the developments yesterday. Okay, so what, what, I'm going to, what am I going to talk about today? One of the frequently asked questions to me is, what's the simplest example of a non-invertible symmetry? Well, it, this is a very subjective question, and it really depends on whom you ask. Now, maybe for string theories and maybe conformal bootstrappers, I would say probably the, I, the example in the Ising conformal field theory is the, the best example. I mean, it's the simplest quantum field theory of all, and it, it, you can really derive this kind of uh, new symmetry from the consideration of modular covariance, standard techniques of tar Cardi. But if you talk to a particle physicist, maybe the person will find the uh, examples in, in QED more natural. Now, I would like to rephrase the question a little bit, and that would be the uh, main point of the talk. Instead of asking what's the simplest example of non-invertible symmetry, how do we teach non-invertible symmetry to an undergraduate? 
And hopefully today I will try to provide an example that I, I think is understandable to at least maybe an advanced undergraduate who has taken quantum mechanics. Um, and finally, what are these new symmetries good for? All right. So the model I'm going to consider is the one plus one dimensional quantum, quantum Ising lattice model. It's the simplest many body quantum system of all. So my space is discrete. I have a, my space is a one dimensional chain. It's close and periodic. It has n qubit. Uh, so the, uh, shown by this dot. My time is continuous. So later on, I'm going to specify a Hamiltonian to describe the continuous time evolution. All right, so my, I'm going to label the qubits by this index j, running from one all the way to n, and j is identified with j plus n. This is a fine dimensional system. On every qubit, I have a two dimensional Hilbert space, which I denote by h sub j. It's just a two level system, nothing fancy. If I have n of them, my total Hilbert space is a tensor product of this local qubit, and therefore I have a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space in this system. And everything I'm going to say in the rest of the talk holds for any value of n. You can take n to be one all the way to 100 or whatever. And this is the Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian I'm going to consider is the standard transverse field Ising Hamiltonian. So let me explain this a little bit. On every qubit, there is a, uh, the local operators are the poly X operator and the poly Z operators. They obey the standard commutation relation of the poly algebra. Now, why do I choose this particular Hamiltonian? Uh, this is the simplest Hamiltonians that respect uh, the symmetries that are of interest to me. So let's quickly go through that. The defining symmetry of the Ising model is a Z2 global symmetry. The Z2 global symmetry in this particular presentation is just a product of the poly X operators on every side. This is a symmetry that flips the spin from up to down everywhere. Uh, so it's a, it, in condensed matter physics, this is known as an on-site symmetry because it's a product of local unitary operator at every site. Now this eta operator is, uh, it, it flips the sign of the poly Z operator, it leaves the X invariant, and it squares to one, nothing fancy. This Hamiltonian is the simplest uh, Hamiltonian respecting the Z2 symmetry to leading order. X is Z2 even, so I can write down linear turning X. Z is Z2 odd, so I have to work with quadratic uh, turns in the Hamiltonian. Of course, I can add higher order turns, which I will do later on in the talk, but to leading order, this is the simplest one. In addition to the Z2 symmetry, there's another symmetry that will be of interest to me. That's the lattice translation of the Ising Hamiltonian, which I denote by T. I can write T very explicitly in terms of the poly operators, but let me not bother you with the explicit formula. It just maps uh, the poly x at site j to j plus one, so on and so on. I work on a periodic chain with n qubits, and therefore t to the n is one. Okay, so these are just two ordinary invertible symmetries of the Ising model for every value of this coupling constant g. This Hamiltonian realized the simplest uh, Landau paradigm. The phase diagram looks like this. When g is very small, the second term dominates, and we're instructed to diagonalize all the qubits to be in the same direction. They can all be pointing up or they can all be pointing down. And that's the phase where the Z2 global symmetry here is spontaneously broken. In the particle field theory language, you have a double whale potential. So this is a Z2 broken phase. In condensed matter physics, we call it the older phase. When G is very large, so we're taking the opposite limit, the first term dominates and you are instructed to diagonalize the qubit in the x basis. So this thing is kind of pointing sideways. But this time, it has to point in a specific direction. It has to point in the direction where x is plus one to minimize the energy. So you have a unique ground state in that limit where g goes to plus infinity. And that's the z2 unbroken phase, known as the disorder phase. Right at g equals to one, there's a second order phase transition when you take the thermodynamic limit where n goes to infinity, it's described by the Ising conformal field theory. All right. And we know that at the Ising conformal field theory point, there's a non-invertible symmetry, but this is a microscopic realization of the Ising conformal field theory. Great. 
So everything I said so far, I think, can be found on Wikipedia. Now, what's the question we would like to ask? The question we would like to ask is, right at g equals to 1, that's the point where when you take the thermodynamic limit, it becomes the icing conformal field theory. So g I have set to 1 here. Is there an additional symmetry? Now, I want to be more precise about what I meant by an additional symmetry. Because you know, different people have different definitions on symmetries and have uh, many discussions with people on this point. But let me be precise about what I meant here. So what I meant is, is there an operator, and I really underline the word operator, such that it obeys the following list of conditions. Condition zero, the reason I label it to be zero is because I find it so trivial that I probably didn't even have to say it, is that it's an operator acting on the two to the n-dimensional Hilbert space that I started with. That's how we usually think about symmetry. You have a Hilbert space, it could be a quantum field theory, it could be a lattice model, you just have some operator acting within that Hilbert space. So don't give me a map that maps from one Hilbert space to another. I just want the symmetry acting within this two to the n-dimensional Hilbert space. I'm not going to make it any bigger, I'm not going to make it any smaller. Okay. So this is condition zero. It sounds totally innocent, but it's in fact the condition that's usually relaxed in the literature. Second, we can talk about, we can talk for hours about what it means to be a symmetry. And it's a very interesting conversation. But I think everyone will at least agree that at bare minimum, it has to lead to a conserved operator. And what do I mean by conserve? That's what comes with the Hamiltonian, you know, quantum Hamiltonian model. So I want an, the operator to commute with the Hamiltonian. This is not a sufficient condition for what I have in mind to be a symmetry, but it's at least a necessary condition. The final one is a little bit hard to describe, but I want this operator to become the non-invertible symmetry of the icing conformal field theory as, take, as I take the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so that's the questions I would like to pose for this very simple many-body uh, lattice model. Uh, any question uh, at this point? Is G one being critical on the exact statement? It, yes, yes. It's exactly one, not 1.00 1 something, yeah. So it's very easy to obey zero and one, but there are many more conditions, as I said, that I want to impose on symmetry. But I don't really want to get into that, but let me just say in one sentence. What's most important about symmetry in a quantum system is the notion of locality. And two is a very easy way to satisfy that because I'm shooting for something that I know uh, works in the continuum. But let me not get into the more details. I can talk about that for hours, but maybe not for this talk. Okay. Yes, please. Well, again, <laughs> I don't, don't really want to talk about it, but I'll be happy to talk about it afterwards. But, okay, let, let me give it an answer, <laughs> a, a, a vague answer. I want the symmetry to act on the local operators in a reasonable way, and then I'm going to plead the fifth on what I mean by reasonable. All right? Now, if you ask this question to someone on the street, what's the uh, answer he's going to give you? Well, the person will say, at g equals to one, of course there's an additional symmetry. And that is, that is the Quermer's one-year transformation. And what is the Quermer's one-year transformation? It's a transformation that maps xj to zj, zj plus one, and zj, zj plus one to xj plus one. Now, let's take a look. If I do that transformation, this term gets mapped to that, that term maps to this, and exactly when g is one, the Hamiltonian is invariant. Great. And usually, you know, when we learn symmetries in quantum field theory or lattice model, what do we do? You know, you have a Lagrangian, you have some fields, and you write down some transformation on the fields, and if the Lagrangian is invariant, okay, that's probably good enough to be a symmetry. But I'm sure for people in this uh, audience who know that that's far from being sufficient. We learn it the painful way from Adler and Bell and Jacquif that if a classical Lagrangian has some, is invariant under some transformation, that may not lead to an actual true quantum global symmetry. And we'll see something like that happen. Okay, so we have a Hamiltonian invariant under some transformation. If you ask Wigner if this is a symmetry or not, Wigner will insist that you have to find a unitary operator that implement this transformation. Well, is it implemented by a unitary operator? The answer turns out to be no. And let me give a really two-line argument why this cannot possibly be the case. 
So let's say there is a unitary operator u, such that u implement this transformation. So what would Wigner say? Wigner would say that means u x j u inverse is z j z j plus one, right? That's how symmetry acts in the Heisenberg picture. But then you run into a contradiction by applying this symmetry transformation on the defined z2 operator of the Ising model, which is this eta. Let me remind you, eta is a product of xj. When I apply this transformation on the product of xj, I move the uu inverse into the each individual term, I get the product of zj, zj plus one, but I'm on, uh, I'm on a closed periodic chain. So every single zj appears exactly twice. zj is a poly z operator, it squares to one, and therefore this expression is just one. And I arrive at the conclusion that the defining symmetry for the Ising model eta is one, and that's a contradiction. So from this very simple reasoning, we immediately learned that the Quermer's one-year transformation cannot possibly be implemented by a unitary operator. If there's any lesson to be learned from this simple reasoning, is that we should never write arrows in theoretical physics. When we write <laughs> arrows, you, know, you don't know what you are talking about. We should always write equal equality. Well, this is something I learned painfully from my distinguished collaborator. <laughs> so we should use category theory. <laughs> I'm th I say <laughs> theoretical <laughs> physics. In math, uh, I think it's allowed. <laughs> okay, so that motivates the following question. What are the equalities for these red arrows? So I'm going to give you the answer first and, and then present the derivation. So here's the answer. Well, it looks a little bit daunting, but don't worry. Let me walk you through every element of this answer. So this is an operator D. Uh, the first thing you should note it's a very explicit operator. In fact, as I said, everything I'm, I'm about to say in the talk holds true for any finite n. So if you get so bored of this talk, you are welcome to take out your Mathematica and coding this operator into Mathematica, and you are just going to find a two to the n by two to the n big matrix, and you can check everything I'm going to say. So it's a very explicit operator, it's just a big matrix. Let me walk you through different elements. The first factor is a root two. Now, it's a very subtle, subtle root two. In fact, arguably, this is the most subtle factor of the expression, and I'm not going to say too much about it, and that's why I show it in gray. The second factor is the face. I'm also not going to say too much about it, but I'm just going to say that this eight is actually the same eight as the number of Lycon dimensions in superstring theory. <laughs> and you can see our paper here for more details, but let me not say too much about it. Now let me, let me walk you through this green factor. The first thing to notice about this green factor is that each local factor here is a unitary operator. That's very easy to check. You just take this operator, take the dagger, multiply them together, you get one. You can do that in probably five seconds. So this product of local unitary operator, of course, is still unitary. So the green part is totally innocent. It's a unitary operator. I'm going to denote this unitary operator by u sub kw. k and w stands for Kramer's and Wendy. In fact, this is an operator study by many condensed matter physicists and quantum information theorists. It's known as a sequential quantum circuit. This is the figure for it, but don't worry, don't worry about what it means. Um, now, finally, there's a factor, which is a projection. Eta, remember, is just a Z2 operator. That's a defined symmetry of Z2, uh, of the Ising model. Okay, so that's the operator. Now, what I claim this operator does is that it obeys the following two equalities. And these are the equalities for the previous red arrows. And this is true for all sides, for, for j all the way from one to n. Notice that these two equalities are very similar to the equality here, except for the fact that at this point, I didn't dare to move d from the right to the left. In fact, I couldn't, because the operator d contains a projection operator. The projection operator, by definition, has a huge kernel. It annihilates every single z2 odd state. So I couldn't move the d to the other side. And that's actually the reason how I evade the previous contradiction. Okay, so that's the first point, that the precise meaning of the Kramer's one-year transformation is this, are, are these equalities. And because of these equalities, you can easily show that d commutes with the Hamiltonian at the critical point. Now we have an operator acting on the Hilbert space. It commutes with the Hamiltonian, so it, it checks the first two conditions I wrote uh, when I phrased the question. The only novel thing is that it does not have an inverse, and that's a non-invertible symmetry. 
Now, at this point, you might ask, look at this gigantic expression. Don't worry about the root two. But if you look at this, why not just take the green part, right? That occupies most of the page. Why, why, doesn't, why can't we just use this as the symmetry? So let's do some comparison between the sequential quantum circuit UKW and this non-invertible operator D. The sequential quantum circuit is in fact not a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. When you try to commute UKW through the Hamiltonian, they don't agree. You made a mistake at one point. A related point is that if you look at this expression, it takes a reference point to start, which is site one. But there's absolutely nothing special about site number one. We are on a closed periodic chain. Every site should be on the same footing as every other site. So this green expression doesn't have a translation symmetry. The interesting thing is that when you multiply it by a projection, it turns out to be translational invariant, even though it's not manifest from the formula. So you can either work with this unitary operator, which is not a symmetry, but it's invertible for whatever it's worth. Or you can try to work with a non-invertible operator, which ends up to be a symmetry. Now, I would really argue that this non-invertibility is not a bug. It's just a feature of the, this special symmetry. Uh, yes. Yeah, please, please. So, so, this, so, so basically what you're telling me is that uh, uh, this works because it's projection. That it's acting actually on a part of the Hilbert space. Yes, yes. Uh, now, uh, if you consider a Hilbert space, and if you have energy spectra, if you rotate each energy spectrum differently, these are also similar. Very good, very so good. If you allow your, your me to use projection, you yeah. can invent many other Oh, oh absolutely, so yeah. Yeah, very good, operation. very good, very good, very good. In fact, I think this point was already mentioned in your paper with Daniel Harlow. And I think the, the, the example you gave is if you take a Hamiltonian and project to the 40 second energy eigenstate, yeah. is that the symmetry or not? And I think I got the number right. I think it was 40 second. Now, the reason that that I consider not to be a symmetry in a general many body quantum system is because it doesn't act in a reasonable way on the local operator. Right, that was the criteria we mentioned. So this one does. This so one on the, that's right. This one, at least acting on these two kinds of local operator, is completely uh, innocent. It's an interesting fact about how it acts on the individual. In this case, this is the only one which doesn't? Uh, I think so. I don't have a proof, but I think so. Yeah, but that would not act in a reasonable way on the local operator. You mean one plus xj? What do you mean by on-site projection? I'm sorry, I didn't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that might not commute with the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I say I wanted to act in a reasonable way on the local operators. I also wanted to commute with the Hamiltonian. And there's a much better way to package the sentence that you're acting in a reasonable way on the local operator. But let me not comment on that. Yeah. Well. Um, yes and no. So, um, the, actually, that, that's the second part of my talk. So maybe we'll, we'll get. I think it will be clear at that point. Okay. Let me just comment that there's uh, there are many other works uh, related to the Kramer's Wenner transformation, but the corresponding symmetry is formulated as a map from one Hilbert space to another. Especially, there's a recent discussion by oh, it's actually hidden here by Masaki and, and collaborators. Okay, now, so at g equals to one, we find that there are two, three symmetries. There's a lattice translation, there's a Z2 operator eta, and there's a non-invertible operator D. Whenever you have a set of symmetries, well, let's compute their algebra. Let's start with the easy one. T to the n is one, that's a lattice translation. Eta squared is one, they commute. This D is more interesting. It contains a projection. So when you multiply D with eta, you just get D. Uh, as I said earlier, D commutes with the lattice translation. In fact, D multiplied by the lattice translation is D dagger. So D is not a self-adjoint operator on the lattice. It is a self-adjoint operator in the continuum, though. The most interesting part of the algebra is what happens to D squared. And I emphasize the only reason that I'm able to compute D squared is because D acts within the same Hilbert space rather than the map. D squared is one plus eta times T. If you still remember the expression from the continuum, in the continuum, you don't have this lattice translation factor. And on the lattice, uh, it mixes with the lattice translation. 
This formula, if you remove this part, it roughly tells you that the D is a half lattice translation in the Z2 even sector. If you take the continuum limit, the lattice translation by one side goes away. If you have a million sites doing one lattice translation, it amounts, amounts to doing nothing. And so in the large n, in the n goes to infinity limit, t goes to one, and you recover the non-invertible symmetry of the continuum icing COD. Okay, so that's the presentation of the answer. In the remaining, maybe, I don't know, five minutes, let me give you the derivation. Now, this is usually the point where the audience goes to sleep and check their emails, but <laughs> actually the derivation is kind of inspired by string theory, so I hope I can keep the audience engaged, <laughs> even in the derivation. So, to, to divide this uh, symmetry, we have to take a slight detour, a really slight detour, to consider a different model, a different lattice model of the Maharana chain. So now I have two N sites, and I label the sites by this L. And so you can see that there are more dots on this circle on this side. On every side, I have a real single value Grassmannian variable, which I denote by chi sub L. And they obey the Clifford algebra. Okay? And the Hamiltonians I'm going to consider, uh, actually I'm going to consider two such Hamiltonians, H plus and H minus. And each one of them is just a the nearest neighbor interaction between the Maharana fermions. And uh, for H minus, I flip the sign at one link. Now, what does that mean for, for a continuous CFT point of view? If you go to the large end limit, uh, they, they flows to a continuum Maharana conformal field theory. Massless Maharana conformal field theory, no interaction, no mass whatsoever. If you pick the plus, that's the Maharana CFT in the Roman sector. If you pick the minus, that's the Maharana fermion in the Nebuchadnezzar sector. Either case, we have a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. What are the symmetries of the Maharana model? There's a fermion parity, which is the product of all the chi's. The face is just inserted so that it squares to one. It flips the sign of chi that's manifestly a symmetry. There's another symmetry which translates the Maharana fermion by one site. This symmetry is a Z2N symmetry because I have two N sites, right? I double the site. Even for the anti-periodic sector minus, namely the Nebuchadnezzar sector, there's a translation symmetry. You just have to put a minus sign somewhere. Okay, so these are the two invertible symmetries of this Maharana model. Now, why did I go, uh, go out of my way to talk about this Maharana model? That is because in class, well, actually, sorry, before that, I have to say something about the anomaly. So there's an interesting anomaly uh, in the Maharana model. If you try to compute the commutation relation between the lattice translation and the fermion parity, there's an important minus sign here. It's a one-line calculation that's very easy to do. So this is a minus sign the Roman sector. If you're in the Nebuchadnezzar sector, there's no minus sign. In fact, this minus sign uh, corresponds to the following minus sign the Maharana CFT. In the continuum limit, this minus one to the, uh, F becomes the non chiral fermion parity of the Maharana CFT. The lattice translation, on the other hand, becomes the chiral fermion parity that flips only the left-handed Maharana, the sign of the left-handed Maharana, but not the right-handed Maharana. And it is known that minus one to the F left and minus one to the F have a Tehuf anomaly in the free Maharana CFT. In fact, this is the Tehuf anomaly. Uh, this Tehuf anomaly is mod eight, meaning that you have to have eight Maharana fermions for the anomaly to cancel. And that's precisely the reason why in type two superstring, where, where we do chiral GSO projection, uh, you have to have eight Maharana fermions in the light quantization. On the lattice, you only see the mod two version of this uh, anomaly, which is manifested by this minus sign. Now, if there's a single most important minus sign of the whole story, that's going to be this one, which we will come back to in just a minute. Now, why did I go out of my way to talk about this Maharana model? That's because in classroom, we sometimes hear the statement that Maharana equals icing. So eventually, we would like to use the knowledge in Maharana and and derive the symmetries we uh, talk about in the icing model. But that statement is not completely true. It's 99% true, but it's the remaining 1% that's relevant for the rest of the talk. Now, for, for, from the continuum point of view, you can do bosonization, but let me quickly say what it means for a condensed matter physicist. For condensed matter physicists, the fact that Maharana equals to icing, roughly speaking, is the fact that you can start with this Maharana Hamiltonian model and do the so-called jordan wigner transformation. What is a jordan wigner transformation? You should view it just as a change of variables. On the left, you have the original Maharana fermion fields. On the right, you introduce some uh, poly 
uh, algebra, poly uh, variables. The only thing you need to know about these two equalities di discovered by Jordan and Wigner is that they are compatible with the uh, Clifford algebra on the left and the poly algebra on the right. If you do this change of variables, you can rewrite the, these Hamiltonians in the following way. For most of the turns, you see you land on the Ising Hamiltonian on the nose, but you make one mistake at one link. At this link, there's a minus one to the F, which written in terms of the poly operators is a product of all the sigma z's. And this was, of course, known long ago, and this is the reason why Marana and Ising globally are different. They agree locally for most of the turns, but globally you make a mistake. Now, for anyone who has studied string theory, it should be clear what, sh what, what we should do next to fix this uh, uh, mismatch. The thing we should do is the GSO projection. More precisely, it's the GSO projection for, we do for the type zero string. So, um, and in the string theory language, where we should sum over the spin structures of the Maharana models to obtain the Ising model. And uh, as everyone uh, knows from string theory, that there are two steps uh, in doing the GSO projection. Step number one, we sum over the Nebuch-Schwarz and the Roman sector together. So we temporarily, and I emphasize only temporarily, make the Hilbert space a little bit larger. We take the direct sum of the NS sector and the Roman sector, and we consider this bigger Hamiltonian in this bigger Hilbert space. There's also a second step where we project uh, to, to the appropriate symmetry uh, sector. And so in the first step, we make the Hilbert space twice as large. In the second step, we reduce it uh, by a factor of one half. So at the end of the day, we have a Hilbert space that's two to the n-dimensional. Now, you see, if we do this two step, if I'm in this little block, I have, uh, I have minus here, but then I project to the minus one to the f equals two plus one sector, so this whole thing is just a minus sign. So that sign agrees with the rest of the term. If I'm in the Roman sector, then I pick the plus sign here, but then I project to the minus one sector so that this whole thing is a minus one. Again, agrees with the rest of the term. So after the GSO projection, we recover the critical Ising model on the nose. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of, of how you obtain the Ising model globally from the Maharana fermion system. Well, but the reason I want to do this exercise is I want to ask, under this GSO projection, where is the Maharana translation? On the Ising model, we only have n sites. There's no Z2n symmetry, no matter how you look at it. So let's see what happened to the Maharana translation. Naively, I can consider this operator. I put the Maharana translation operator uh, in the two blocks. But this operator doesn't survive the second step of GSO. Because, as we said earlier, T plus has a minus sign. Uh, in its commutation with the uh, fermion parity. So when we project to a definite minus one to the F symmetry sector, T plus will, uh, doesn't act within that projected Hilbert space. So this operator doesn't descend to a symmetry of the Ising model. And that's consistent with what we know. We don't have a Z2N symmetry in the Ising model. Instead, if you square this operator, square the Maharana translation symmetry, then the minus sign goes away, and this operator T is a legit operator for the Ising model. And that is just the Ising translation that shifts the Ising side by one. And we could have stopped here, and that's what people usually do. You know, in the Ising model, we have a lattice translation, we have a Z2 symmetry, and that's about it. But if you think about it, it we're doing something really unfair to one of the lattice translation. You see, it's only the T plus that has a minus sign with minus one to the F, but T minus is completely innocent. It doesn't do anything wrong. And so why should we penalize T minus because of the fault of another operator, T plus? So instead, you can consider this operator. You know, you just set the problematic operator to a big zero, and you leave the T minus over there. This operator acts perfectly within the projected Hilbert space and should commute with the Hamiltonian of the Ising model. And that, if you write it in terms of the poly operators, is, is exactly the answer I presented earlier. Okay, so to uh, quickly summarize, uh, from, the, from, from viewing the Ising model as Marana uh, model with a Z2 symmetry gauge, we find this non-invertible operator. What, what is the 
Very good. And again, as I said in the very beginning, I'm going to plead the fifth on the square root of two. In fact, in the very last factor, let me give you a quick justification. But for, for the purpose of this talk, you see, the normalization doesn't matter. You can multiply it by square root of 17. I don't care. It's still going to be an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. It's not unitary, so you don't have a preferred normalization anyways. But I have a better answer than that, but it would take me too long to answer it. Okay. Now, so the upshot is that the Maharana translation of the Maharana model becomes a non-invertible symmetry under the global GSO projection. And the reason that it becomes non-invertible is because of an anomaly between the Maharana translation and the fermion parity. And that anomaly is precisely the anomaly we face in type 2 superstring theory. I'm almost running out of time, but let me just quick, quickly say what is it good for. So, we don't want to solve the critical Ising model for the hundredth time. So rather, we can ask, are there any deformation you can add to the critical Ising model while preserving this new non-invertible symmetry? And there is, and that's considered by this, uh, in this paper. You can add this uh, deformation that will preserve both the V2 symmetry and the non-invertible symmetry. So if you go away from the critical point, that's this G variable, you break the non-invertible symmetry. But if you go along this axis, you preserve the non-invertible symmetry. And these people, they do DMRG and find that the phase diagram of this deformed model as a function of the coupling constant lambda is the following. You start with a critical icing CFT. And when lambda is very close, this deformation actually co corresponds to the TT bar deformation. And TT bar deformation is irrelevant, so there's an open region where it stays the co icing conformal field theory. Then it hits a tricritical icing point. And then after that point, you, they find a gap phase with uh, three very low-lying states whose energy splitting is exponentially small in the volume. So in the infinite volume limit, it becomes a gap phase with three superselection sectors. Now, in theoretical physics, it's very common to see a factor of two. Three is perhaps less common. So where does this three come from? And is this an accident that we have a gapless phase on the one side and a non-trivial gap phase on the other side? Is this something more general? Is this something special to this uh, particular deformation? So what we show in this recent paper is that for any Hamiltonian that commutes with the non-invertible symmetry D, the low energy phase in the thermodynamic limit has to be either gapless or gap with the number of superselection sectors being a multiple of three. So what we show is that this feature we observe in this particular deformation is actually something more generally true. But how do we understand the three? The non-invertible symmetry basically implies that your model has to have coexistence of order and disorder. Neither order or disorder is invariant under the non-invertible symmetry. In the order phase, you have two ground states. In the disorder phase, you have one, one ground state. When they coexist, two plus one is three, and that's where the three comes from. This is actually a generalization of the uh, theorem that I, 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 we discussed with Xi Ying and collaborators, and also Qi Ming in the audience uh, many years ago. But here we provide a lattice argument. So this is one of trivial applications of the non-invertible symmetry. Someone hands you a Hamiltonian, you just go ahead and come, come, uh, uh, see if it commutes with the non-invertible symmetry. If they commute, then it says something non-trivial about the low energy phase. OK, let me quickly summarize. So in the quantum icing lattice model, there's this non-invertible uh, non symmetry that mixes with the lattice translation. It arises from the Maharana lattice translation. And the fact that it turns into a non-invertible symmetry is because of an anomaly and it has non-trivial consequences on the low energy phase. Finally, I want to go back to Hiroshi's question. I want to compare these two examples. On the one hand, we have the 1 plus 1D Ising lattice model. On the other hand, we have the 3 plus 1D QED. On the le left-hand side, you have a finite dimensional system in 1 plus 1 dimension. On the right-hand side, you have a continuum quantum field theory with an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. These two systems look very, very different. But if you look at the symmetries close enough, they're actually surprisingly similar. Both of them have a non-invertible symmetry. In today's talk, I talk about this, uh, but I didn't get the chance to talk about that. Now, let me compare these two non-invertible symmetry. Both of them contains an invertible piece. This blue piece here is the sequential quantum circuit. In the chiral symmetry story, that's the naive chiral rotation you do. ZA is the axial current. Both, uh, in the Ising model, there's a sum of two turns, which is the reason that makes it non-invertible. In the, chiral, uh, in, in the QED case, there's a path integral over some auxiliary gauge field, which makes the resulting operator non-invertible. In the QED case, 
the trick is to introduce a fractional quantum whole state, which is a two plus one dimensional topological quantum field theory to cure a, a, a global symmetry in the three plus one DQED. In the Ising model, what would be the analogous TQFT? The analogous TQFT has to be zero plus one D. What is a zero plus one D topological uh, quantum field theory? Any quantum mechanics with a non-trivial Hamiltonian will not be topological. So a topological quantum mechanics has to be a, just a number, a constant number of ground state. In the fractional quantum whole state, it was important as a fermionic TQFT. So here we should also look for a zero plus one D fermionic topological quantum mechanics. What is a, a zero plus one D topological quantum mechanics? That's a Maharana zero mode. What is a Maharana zero mode? That's a square root of two. In the Ising case, the non-invertible symmetry comes from an anomaly involving the lattice translation of the Maharana or Kitaev chain. In the QED case, the non-invertible symmetry comes from the ABJ anomaly of the Dirac fermions. In the Ising case, it exchanges order with this order. In the QED case, it exchanges monopole with the dial. So for me, it's really nice to see that these two seemingly unrelated systems actually share very similar, similar uh, symmetry structure. And for me, I think that's really the beauty of symmetry. And with that, thank you for your attention. So uh, in Ising model case, I thought that V is a, is a topological uh, a line which maps uh, a theory to its dual theory. And uh, here you are considering you acting, D is acting on the same Hilbert space. Uh, so could you clarify yes, yes, the yes, thank relation? You. Yeah. The reason is because if you go away from the critical point, then you can view D as a map from G less than one to some theory with G greater than one. But, but the, uh, here, you, when I phrase the question, I say that I want to stay at G equals to one, which is the self-dual point of the Kramer's one-year duality. So the idea is that you go away G, it's a duality transformation. Okay, it's not Hamiltonian with G to Hamiltonian with G inverse or something? That's right. Ah. Yeah, so precisely at G equals to one, it becomes a symmetry. Okay. But duality, so this is the question about, is duality a symmetry? And here, the thing we want to clarify is that at the self-dual point, the duality doesn't become an ordinary symmetry. It's actually a non-invertible symmetry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so, so regarding the fact that uh, we view self-duality as a non-invertible symmetry, I mean, we know in 2 plus 1D there are other, well, I mean, a web of duality, right? So like NX2 QED has a self-dual structure. So if I want to precisely formulate that, as a symmetry, would that be non-invertible as well, or? Good question. So uh, we have to distinguish exact du duality versus IR duality. This is, for Kramer's one year is an exact duality. If you take 40 equals to four super young mills, there's also an exact duality. For exact duality, it's very straightforward to convert them into a non-invertible symmetry at the uh, self-dual points or at some special points on the parameter space. For IR duality, it's more difficult. I'm not saying that it's impossible. It's something that I've been thinking a lot on the back of my head, but I don't have an answer on the spot. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, so you mentioned that to get from the Ising to the tricritical Ising, you need to do a TT bar deformation. Uh, but typically TT bar deformation with this sign, you would might expect the ground state to become a complex energy state or something. How does it, why do you call it gapless? Yeah. So you see, I only write TT bar very close to the origin. So I'm just saying ah. that close to the Ising CFT point is a TT bar deformation. Okay. When, when field theorists usually talk about TT bar, it's a particular deformation from the continuum field theory point yeah. of view. Here I'm doing a very specific lattice deformation, which near the uh, lambda equals to zero point coincides with TT bar, but I'm not saying that if you go sufficiently away from that point, it's the same as TT bar. Then why is the entire left of the red dot dising CFT. Oh, uh, uh, well, why not? <laughs> well, it's an irrelevant deformation, so there's an open region where it stays the ising CFT, and then eventually you hit the tricritical point. But is there nothing between the tricritical and the ising CFT? Like, is there no massive phase in between that you go through? Well, so, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the Typically, puzzle. when you flow from one fixed point to another, you no, have so, some... So it's important that this is not a flow from one CFT to another CFT. Right, the way to look at it is that we have some UV microscopic uh, lattice model. And the flow goes this way, not this way. Okay. Right, you pick a parameter, you go down. Okay. You don't go horizontally. I think that, okay, now I understand your confusion. Okay. Yeah, the, the arrow goes uh, vertically. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's uh, thank you for coming again. Okay, thank you.